In previous videos in this series we've gone through some of the mathematical theory which hopefully then persuaded us that quantum entanglement is not just classical entanglement with a twist. Mathematics is clear. The two entangled electrons A and B seem to be connected in some special way. There's no mystery about the total spin of the pair. It is zero and would be measured to be zero in any direction whether we're talking about actual experimental measurement or using the mathematics of quantum mechanics to measure the components of the total spin in any direction it is zero. However when you start to consider the spin of each individual electron it turns out that they each cannot be said to have a definite spin direction even though they have spin each of them. In other words there is no direction in space where if you measure the spin component of one of the electrons in that direction you will be guaranteed to get the answer plus one. It will always be a 50-50 chance of getting plus one or minus one. Now that seems strange enough in itself. On top of that however as soon as one of them has the component of its spin measured in some direction then the other electron can be said to have a definite spin direction opposite to the first. Ignoring the mathematics that seemed to suggest this strange phenomenon there was the suggestion that the electrons when they first become entangled made some agreement with one another on how they would behave if measured. In other words they would take on board a number of hidden variables or hidden data values. In the last video we discussed how John Bell came up with a way to test this idea and we stated that the results of such experiments came out saying that the hidden variable idea was not tenable. What we didn't do is discuss those specific experiments or the ideas behind them and what follows we'll try to do just that. This particular video number 11 is more about preparing the groundwork for the Bell tests to be discussed in the final video. I say preparing the groundwork because we need to do a little bit of work thinking about photons rather than electrons. Tests of Bell's inequality are usually done using entangled photons as these are somewhat easier to work with than electrons in practical situations. We'll get to what we need to know about photons in a minute but you should understand that in discussing the theory of entanglement earlier it was easier to deal with the entanglement of spin and in particular spin a half particles and so we considered pairs of electrons fermions entangled in the singlet state. It was recognized that this was somewhat awkward in that when dealing with the spin of two fermions it would probably have been more realistic to look at an electron positron entangled pair. Electron positron pairs can actually be created in situations where sufficient energy is available in particle interactions or decays. This could be when various particles interact at high energies and when there's some spare energy available an electron positron pair can be created out of the vacuum. Another way in which they may come about is in the extremely rare mode of decay of the neutral pion. Less than 1 in 10 million pi zeros decay like this by producing an electron and an anti-electron or positron. Despite the ridiculously small numbers this is a useful illustration of the way in which an entangled pair might actually occur. If the initial neutral pion is at rest then the positron and the electron move away in opposite directions and with equal and opposite momentum. Not only that they would constitute an entangled pair in the singlet state and their spins would be in opposition. They would have opposite spin directions. Now I'm going to have to be careful here. Because one of the particles, the positron, is positive and the other, the electron, is negative, their spin magnetic moments, the arrows I've been drawing in red, will actually be in the same direction. So it's not that the two magnetic moments have somehow interacted and had to be in opposite directions in this situation. It's not the same argument as we made for a pair of imaginary electrons where we said they would become entangled by getting to their lowest magnetic energy state by having their magnetic moments opposite which would then automatically mean that their spin angular momenta were also in opposite directions. No, here it is the fact that the neutral pion had no spin angular momentum s to start with and this means that the positron-electron pair must also have a total spin angular momentum of zero. 
The positron and electron must therefore have equal and opposite spin angular momenta of plus and minus h bar over 2. And you'll recall that I've been drawing those arrows in blue. It's that old debate we had in an earlier video as to what I mean by the casual word spin. Do I mean spin angular momentum or spin magnetic moment? Anyway, we came to understand that the opposition of the spins in an entangled pair, in the case of an electron-positron pair, I definitely mean only spin angular momentum, that opposition seemed rather mystical, for want of a better word. As mentioned a moment ago, it's not possible to say along which axis in space the two spin angular momenta would be aligned, just that they would be opposite to one another. We came to understand that you would not be able to say one was up and one was down, or one was to the left and one was to the right, or one was in any particular direction and the other was opposite. You'll notice here I've made the arrows blue to be consistent with what I've used for spin angular momentum rather than red, which was for magnetic moment. All we could say was that the spins were opposite. It was as though neither one of them had a direction in space and yet their spins were opposite to one another. And we showed it like this to try to picture our ignorance. Here I've used multiple blue arrows as we only have opposites of angular momentum for an electron-positron pair. Some physicists have put it like this. We know everything there is to know about the spin state of the pair of particles together. The total spin is zero, the spins are opposite but we know nothing about the spin components of either of the individual particles. However, as we've said, once a measurement of one of the particles is made, then things are different. If the component of the spin of the positron on the left is measured, say in the z direction, and found to be up, then the spin of the electron on the right would definitely be down in the z direction, meaning that if the z component of its spin were then to be measured in the z direction, then that spin would definitely be found to be down with 100% probability. Measures in any other direction, of course, and the usual probability rules of quantum mechanics would apply for that spin down particle. On the other hand, starting again with the entangled pair of particles, if the component of the spin of the one on the left is measured, say, along the x-axis and found to be to the right, then the other would definitely be to the left, and so on. It's as though, before any measurement is made on them, they each have no definite spin direction in space, but once one of them is measured, they both know what direction their spins are in, and those directions are related. That's the weirdness of entanglement. Just to remind you, with an entangled pair of electrons, because the particles are the same type, then that oppositeness applies to the spin magnetic moments as well as to the spin angular momenta of the pair. However, with an entangled positron-electron pair, the oppositeness only applies to the spin angular momentum. The magnetic moments would actually be in the same direction. We had a long, boring discussion of that in an earlier video. Anyway, those conclusions about pairs of fermions, either two electrons, or in the more realistic case, an electron-positron pair, those conclusions came about from our discussion of quantum mechanics based on experiments, and also on the fact that Bell's inequality was violated by experiments, or at least we said it was violated. We didn't actually discuss an experiment to prove it. We went on to conclude that from the violation of Bell's inequality, it could not be that each fermion somehow knew what answer to give if the components of its spin were measured in any direction. They could not have hidden variables or hidden data encoded within each of them to tell them how to behave. Otherwise, Bell's inequality would not have been violated. The only conclusion possible was that there had to be some kind of weird communication between the particles once one of them had been measured. At least that was the conclusion. What we didn't do, as I say, is show how Bell's inequality could actually be tested by experiment. One of the reasons for that emission was that all our theory had been concerned with fermions, electrons, spin-a-half particles, and experiments on Bell's inequality with fermions would be difficult, to say the least. For example, when we were dealing with electrons early on, we glossed over some of the experimental issues. 
You may recall, for in instance, the issue of measuring the spin component of an electron in a particular direction, and by that I mean the magnetic moment direction now. We had said that to measure the component of an electron's spin in, say, the z direction, you would need to put it in a strong magnetic field in the z direction and see if the electron gave off a photon. If it did, we could say that the spin magnetic moment had been opposite to the field initially and had flipped to be in the field direction, thus giving off the photon. And so that was our measurement. The spin had been opposite to the field. If, on the other hand, it did not give off a photon when it settled down in a strong magnetic field in the direction of the field, then we could say that the spin magnetic moment had already been in the direction of the field. So that was our measurement. The spin had been in the direction of the magnetic field. Either way, of course, the spin of the electron ends up being in the direction of the magnetic field of the measurer. But that's another matter. We can say that we had measured what it was before we made the measurement. It must have been down if it gave off a photon and up if it didn't. Of course, putting individual electrons in a magnetic field and watching for emitted photons is a messy way of doing things. And I'm sure you realize that it's not a very practical way to measure spin orientation, to say the least. In fact, it was so awkward even to discuss it in that way that we imagine having a special device that would measure the components of the spin of the electron in a particular direction. That imaginary device helped us through the theory without having to worry about the practicalities of measuring the spin component. We said that if we had an electron spin that had been prepared in some direction like this, we could use this imaginary device to measure the spin in any direction, say the Z direction, by placing the measuring device like this. If we did, then it would either measure plus one, which means the electron would not have given off a photon, and we took that to mean it was already pointing up in the Z direction. Or the device would register minus one, which would mean it would have given off a photon, and in a way the particle could be assumed to have been pointing in a negative Z direction, even though it had now flipped positive during the measurement. However, we now want to think about how Bell's inequality could be tested in practice. So we can't ignore such issues. We can't pretend we have this kind of imaginary device. How can we get around this? What could be done? What kind of experiment could we do to prove that Bell's inequality is violated and hence confirm that the hidden variable idea was not tenable? How would you do it in practice? Well, practical experiments on Bell's inequality are usually done using entangled photons rather than electrons or any other kind of fermions. The reason is that photons are, in many ways, easier to work with. So that's the switch that we're now going to make. We are going to be thinking about entangled photons. Fortunately, we don't need to go through all the theory of entangled photons because we should be able to make enough links to the quantum mechanics we've already done on entangled electrons, fermions. Hopefully you'll see this as we go along and you should be able mentally to make the jump from what we already know about electrons to what we will assume about photons. Okay, so first of all, what do we mean by entangled photons and how do we get them? Well, one way to get them, although this won't be the way most experiments will start, is by the decay of a neutral pion. So that will be my starter illustration. I said before that less than 1 in 10 million pi zeros decay into an electron-positron pair. What about the rest of the decays? Well, it turns out that most of them, almost 99% of neutral pions, actually decay into two photons. So again, if the neutral pion is initially at rest, the photons from its decay will go off in opposite directions with equal momentum, equal wavelength, equal energy, and they will be an entangled pair of photons. So what is it about these two photons that we will consider to be entangled? Well, the answer is that we're not going to focus on their spin, but rather on their linear polarization. That will be the thing that we will take to be entangled. Most people will, I'm sure, know that photons can be considered to be transverse waves with some kind of particulate nature. 
They are electromagnetic waves and can be thought of as oscillations in the magnetic field and in the electric field. They're sometimes drawn like this. Here, the green oscillation is meant to represent the changing electric field, in this case, in the vertical direction. And the purple oscillation represents the changing magnetic field in the horizontal direction. The two fields are at right angles to each other, but also they're both at right angles to the direction of travel of the wave, making this whole thing what we would call a transverse wave. We could illustrate these vibrations in the fields by imagining looking along the direction of travel and drawing simply double-headed arrows like this. The photon could be coming towards us or going away from us and in this particular case as I've drawn it the electric field shown in green is oscillating in the vertical direction and the magnetic field shown in purple is oscillating in the horizontal direction. That in a sense describes the linear polarization of the wave. Of course it could equally well be linearly polarized in a different way say with the electric field in the horizontal direction and the magnetic field in the vertical direction. In other words 90 degrees different to the first picture. Or in fact it could be polarized in any other rotational position like this or like this. This idea of the linear polarization of the photon as opposed to its spin is going to be the thing that we will focus on when considering the entanglement of photons and Bell's inequality violation. We'll leave the idea of spin behind. It's the linear polarization of entangled photons, entangled in that special weird way which we will be exploiting so that we can think about a Bell test as to whether the hidden variable idea is a valid explanation of entanglement or not. And in order to make any diagrams of linear polarization less messy, I'm going to ignore the magnetic field oscillations and concentrate only on the electric field. For example, if we're imagining a photon going away from us or coming towards us, this kind of illustration will be used to represent what we will call a vertically polarized photon. We will be ignoring the fact that the magnetic field of this is in the horizontal direction. And we'll use this illustration to represent what we will call a horizontally polarized photon. Again, ignoring the fact that the magnetic field here would be in the vertical direction. It's the electric field that will determine how we label polarization as being either vertical or horizontal or perhaps in some other direction. So the question now arises, when a neutral pion decays into two photons, what is it about the linear polarization of each of the photons that makes them entangled? When we were dealing with two electrons in the single state early on, it was the spins of the entangled electrons that were in opposition. But we're not considering the spin of the photons. We're going to focus on the linear polarization. So what is it about the linear polarization of the photons from neutral pion decay that makes them entangled? Well, if you were to look into the physics of this, especially something called parity, you realize that the linear polarizations of the two photons that come from neutral pion decay must come out to be perpendicular to one another. That is the nature of the entanglement of the two photons in this case. It's important to realize, however, that it is possible in other situations to have entangled photons where their linear polarizations have to be in the same direction as one another. But that's not the case for photons that come from neutral pion decay. More on that later, but for now let's stick with this idea of two photons which have come from the decay of a stationary neutral pion. Their linear polarizations will have to be at right angles to one another. So, for example, if photon A is measured to have vertical polarization, then photon B will have horizontal polarization. Alternatively, if photon A is measured to have horizontal polarization, then photon B will be vertical. It's obvious that if the linear polarization of A is measured to be at some other angle, say 45 degrees to the vertical, like this, then B will be like this, at 90 degrees to it, and so on. Just like when we were considering two entangled electrons in the single state, we said that they must have their spins in opposite directions 
in their case at 180 degrees to one another, so here, with entangled photons, at least those from neutral pion decay, they must have their linear polarizations at 90 degrees to one another, in other words, at right angles. However, there's more. From what we learned about entangled electrons, you probably realize that the two entangled photons will not themselves have definite orientations while they are entangled. They're definitely at right angles to one another from neutral pion decay, but being entangled, they don't actually have a definite direction in space. And so just as with our electron situation, it may be better to draw two entangled photons that are coming towards us, not like this, or this, or this, but rather like this, with somewhat blurred arrows or multiple direction arrows for their linear polarization. We should also be able to deduce from our earlier discussions with electrons that because these two photons are entangled in this way, that once one of them has its linear polarization measured and found to be in some direction, it's at that point that the polarization direction of the other photon will instantaneously be known. Suppose, for example, that the polarization of A is measured by passing it through a polarizing filter. Let's say we pass it through a horizontal filter, which I'll show as a slightly grayed out sheet of plastic. The red lines here are meant to indicate the fact that in this rotation, the filter only lets horizontally polarized light through. So we put it in front of photon A. And let's suppose that it gets through. This tells us that the photon is horizontally polarized because it went through a horizontal filter. Immediately, however, we also know that B must be vertically polarized if these photons are entangled in that particular way. I did say before that you can have a pair of photons which are entangled in such a way that their polarizations have to be in the same direction. These wouldn't be from neutral pion decay, but if we had such a pair of photons, and if we put a horizontal filter in front of the photon A, and if it passed through, then again we would know that photon A was horizontally polarized. But in that case, we would also immediately know that the B photon must also be horizontally polarized. I should stress at this point that it is this kind of polarized photons that we're going to be dealing with and will be the backdrop to the Bell test experiments that we'll talk about later. We will not be dealing with photons that have come from pion decay and which have their polarizations at right angles to one another, but rather we will be dealing with entangled photons from another kind of source where the direction of polarization of each photon will be the same as one another. Let me reiterate a few facts. If we had a photon that was not entangled, then it would have a definite polarization direction, horizontal, vertical, or something in between. And we will consider this to be the direction of the electric field oscillation. For simplicity in diagrams, we'll probably imagine photons coming towards us or going away from us, so that vertically and horizontally polarized photons will be pictured like this. However, if we have entangled photons, they cannot be said to have a definite polarization direction. The polarization direction is totally indeterminate until it is measured. And so this kind of picture might be more appropriate. With a pair of entangled photons, A and B, once the polarization direction of one of the pair is measured, the other one will be known. In the case of entangled photons from neutral pion decay, the second polarization will be at right angles to the first. In the case of entangled photons from some other sources, the second photon polarization will be in the same direction as the first. When we get to considering an experiment to test Bell's inequality, we will use entangled photons whose polarizations are orientated in the same direction as one another. At this point now, we need to do a little more preparation before we can get to the bare bones of some kind of Bell test using photons. The first bit of preparation is to make sure we're familiar with polarization filters and what they do to photons, and to make sure that we understand that quantum mechanics is behind what goes on. You should already know that if you take an unpolarized beam of light, one where the photons in the beam each have random directions of their polarization, and you pass that beam of light through a polarization filter, then the light that passes through will contain only photons which are polarized 
in the direction of the filter orientation, what I'll call the filter axis. In other words, here's my drawing of a polarizing filter, the cheap plastic type that you often see in schools and which in a way can be part of polarized sunglasses. I've drawn some dotted lines on the surface of the filter and I'll draw a line through the center perpendicular to the surface which the beam of light will follow. Also, as before, I've added red lines to two opposite sides of the filter to indicate the direction of the polarization that it allows through, its axis of polarization if you like. In this case, it is vertical. Now, consider a beam of unpolarized light coming in from the left. The photons in the beam will be unentangled, so each of them will have their own definite direction of polarization in space. Some of them will be polarized in the same direction as the filter. Some will be at 90 degrees to the direction of the filter. And some of them, most of them in fact, will be at other angles, any other angles. This, or this, or this, or any angle, and every angle in the beam of photons. Here's the kind of thing that will go into the filter. One photon after another, after another. Each probably with a different polarization. Each green double-headed arrow is meant to represent the photon and the alignment of the green arrow is meant to represent the polarization direction of that photon, the electric field, remember. The question is, as these photons move through the filter, what exactly happens? Well, if you've studied even a little bit about this, you'll know the general result that those photons which are polarized in the direction of the filter will get through the filter. Look at this vertically polarized one, for example, which is just about to go through the filter. As it travels, it will pass through the filter because its polarization is in the same direction as the axis of the filter. That's obvious. Now look at this example, a photon with polarization at 90 degrees to the filter axis. Again, it should be fairly obvious that the filter will not allow the photon to get through. It'll be blocked, or we could say absorbed. But what about a photon like this, which I'm showing is just about to enter the filter and which is at 45 degrees to the filter's axis? Will it get through or won't it? If we were dealing with it classically, we would probably say that a component of it would get through and so the wave would get through with a somewhat reduced amplitude and be what we might call dimmer. From simple geometry, the reduction factor would be cos 45 or 1 over root 2. We'd say that the new photon would have been polarized by the filter in its direction but it would have to have a smaller amplitude and be dimmer classically. However, we know from quantum mechanics that that cannot be the case. The photon is a discrete particle of light which cannot be changed in this kind of way. It can't be made dimmer. It either gets through the filter or it doesn't. If it gets through, it will be exactly the same amplitude or brightness if I can use that word. It's just that the polarization will have to have been changed by the filter. You could say that the photon polarization would be kind of twisted by the filter as it went through, or I suppose you could say that the filter was treating the 45 degree photon as though it were vertically polarized and letting it through. The other thing that could happen, of course, is that this 45 degree photon would not get through at all and would be treated as though it were horizontal. Now, we've discussed this kind of thing before with electrons. The filter here is acting a bit like a measuring device. Just like when we measured the spin of electrons, there was a chance that the spin direction would be changed from what we believed it to have been. So here, in measuring the polarization of this 45 degree photon, there will be a sense in which the filter can be thought of as changing the polarization of the photon one way or the other, letting it through or not letting it through, and we can't predict which. In other words, just as we had with electrons and their spin, the sense in which the angle of 45 degrees is relevant here is all related to probability and not to a reduction in the amplitude of the photon wave. The cosine of the angle here, 45 degrees, is 1 over root 2, which when squared is a half. And we will see in a minute 
that that means that this 45 degree photon will have a 50% chance of getting through the filter and a 50% chance of being blocked. Those 45 degree photons that do get through the filter will in one sense have their polarization direction changed to that of the filter. For the other 50% of the photons that are blocked by the filter and don't get through, it's as though in a sense they have their polarization direction changed to being at right angles to that of the filter and so they can't get through. As we've said before, it's a probability thing and making the measurement can change what you had in this case a 45 degree photon into something different. You'll see in a moment that the probability of a photon getting through the filter will be equal, equal to cos squared theta where theta is the angle between the polarization of the incident photon and the filter. If theta is zero degrees then cos squared theta equals one and all such photons will definitely get through. If theta is 90 degrees, then cos squared theta equals zero, and all such photons will be blocked. For any other angle between zero and 90, we can't really predict whether a particular photon will get through or not. We can only say that in all likelihood, a certain fraction of similarly polarized photons would get through, and that fraction is equal to cos squared theta. So, Back to our randomly polarized beam of photons heading towards the polarization filter, now showing some of the early ones that actually got through. Only this one definitely got through, and there it is at a later time. And this one definitely didn't get through. The others, well, some did and some didn't, and those that did ended up with a polarization direction the same as that of the filter axis. I suspect that many school students who've done polarization of light don't realize the sophisticated quantum mechanical ideas that are involved in very simple polarization experiments. Having looked at this, it should be obvious that if the filter were rotated through 90 degrees, then in all likelihood, different photons would have gotten through the filter. This time, the theta in our cos squared theta is obviously the angle between the incident photon polarization and the horizontal, which is the direction of the filter axis in this case. Similarly, of course, the same is true for the filter turned at any angle. Whether a photon gets through or not depends on the angle between the polarization direction of the photon and the direction of the filter axis. And even then, it's a probability thing. It's a cos squared theta thing. That whole idea helps to explain some simple experimental results which must seem baffling to those without any quantum mechanics. Here's one such typical experiment of the kind I mean. Take a polarization filter and place it in front of a luminous white surface. It will look somewhat off-white and most students who learn about this easily accept that this is mainly from the fact that unpolarized light from the white surface has become polarized and some intensity has been lost. In this case, the filter axis is vertical, shown by the red lines along the sides. And so the light getting through to us, the grayish light coming through the filter, will be vertically polarized. I'll show this by a small green double-headed arrow. Now take a second similar filter with its axis at 90 degrees to the first. Notice that the red lines on this second filter are horizontal and then place it almost overlapping the first. The overlapping section becomes black. Again, this is obvious. If you've studied even a little bit of polarization of light, it's obvious. The vertically polarized light coming through the first filter cannot pass through the second filter, which is at 90 degrees to it because the second filter only allows horizontally polarized light to pass through it. The gray sections around the side here have horizontally or vertically polarized light from them, depending which filter you're looking at. However, what can be baffling to school students is that when you take a third filter and you then place it between the two filters with its axis, say, at 45 degrees to the first two, the section where the three filters overlap shows that there is now light getting through. In the classical way of thinking, this doesn't seem to make sense at all. 
In classical logic, if the first filter at the back only gives vertically polarized light, and the second filter at the very front blocks vertically polarized light, then surely, wherever they overlap, no light should get through, regardless of any third filter in the middle. It doesn't make sense, classically. However, if you accept the ideas of quantum mechanics, an explanation of what is going on can be given. Let me deal with the filters in the order the light goes through them, which is 1, 3, 2, when they're all in place, and we'll lay them down in that order. Light is coming out towards us from the back surface. The first filter certainly only gives vertically polarized light from the unpolarized light coming from the white surface. It does this not only by letting any vertically polarized photons through, but also by letting through a proportion of those photons with polarization directions at some angle to the vertical, as long as it's not 90 degrees. The probability of getting through will depend on cos squared of that angle, and once through, the photons will have a definite vertical polarization and not what they had before. Their polarization has been changed so that it is now vertical, and there's the green arrow which shows that. When these vertically polarized photons reach filter number 3, however, the one in the middle, their vertical polarizations will be at 45 degrees to the axis of this filter, filter number 3 and they will each therefore have a 50% chance of getting through. So obviously, half of them will get through and half will be blocked. The half that get through filter number 3 will have their polarization changed to being at the angle of that filter, namely at 45 degrees to the vertical. So there's the green arrow illustrating the photons coming through the overlap region. These 45 degree polarized photons at least those in the triangle region, now reach the front filter, filter number 2, which has its axis horizontal. Once again, therefore, there is a 45 degree angle between the polarization of the photons coming into this part of the third filter and its axis. This means that once again, half of them will get through and have their polarization changed to being horizontal. It all makes sense. The region should be black with just filters 1 and 2, and you should get light through that black region when you insert the middle filter at 45 degrees, or some angle greater than 0 and less than 90. According to quantum mechanics, light should get through the triangle region, even though classical physics couldn't explain it. Quantum mechanics, although baffling in itself, clearly has a way of giving a kind of appreciation for what's going on with polarization experiments like this. Okay, we now know what filters do, and to some extent, why they do it. The second thing that we need to appreciate before we can explore an experimental Bell test is some of the theory behind the quantum mechanics of the photon. We can do this by using our understanding of the mathematics of the entanglement of electrons, and applying those basic ideas to the photon. Hopefully we can map across our ideas from one to the other in order to save going back to first principles. All being well, it should not seem like any new work. To start with, we need to think about what we might use as the basis states for a single unentangled photon. If you remember, for the single electron, which could have two spin states, we took the z-direction as being distinct and special, and we took the two allowed states for that direction, spin up and spin down, as our basis states, and we wrote them in ket form, like this. These states had to be independent of one another, if you like, at right angles in Hilbert space, or rather orthogonal in Hilbert space. We could have started with another direction. We could have started with the x-direction, with the right and left as the basis states, or the in and out of the y direction as the basis states, it wouldn't have really mattered. Each pair would have been orthogonal and a good starting point. But we chose to go with up and down, and we found that we could actually make all the other states, right, left, in, out, whatever, out of the up and down basis states, what we called the z basis. Well, 
the two basis states, the two independent states for the photon are obviously the two polarizations which are at right angles to one another and although we could take any two perpendicular directions around the direction of travel, the two most obvious ones are the vertical and horizontal directions, which we have tended to draw like this. These basis states of vertical and horizontal could therefore be written as kets, like this, V and H, obviously standing for vertical and horizontal. We may well on some occasions write them with arrows, double-headed arrows inside the ket brackets to indicate the oscillation of the electric field, vertical and horizontal. But written either way, these two kets, each for a single photon, remember, will be our two basis states, and we can put them into their own two-dimensional Hilbert space as orthogonal basis states for the single photon. They are, in simplistic terms, at right angles to one another in that Hilbert space, which we could also call polarization space. Here they are, as we will picture them. We probably shouldn't really use the state vectors as the labels for the axes, but we'll do that for convenience. Now this should strike you as being very similar to the electron spin situation, but there is one very important difference. When we were studying the electron Hilbert space, or spin space, this is what we had. These two state vectors had to be put into this Hilbert space 90 degrees apart. And you may recall that when we multiplied their column vector representations together, the answer was zero. They were indeed orthogonal. However, they represented situations in real space that were 180 degrees different, up and down. These are 180 degrees different in real space, but these are 90 degrees different in Hilbert space. It was as though the angle had to be halved in going from real space to Hilbert space, in the sense that a 180 degree difference in real space became a 90 degree difference in Hilbert space for the spin space of the electron. This became even more obvious when we came to think about the right and left states for the electron. In real space, right and left are each 90 degrees from up and down, but of course in Hilbert space they had to be 45 degrees from the up state and 45 degrees from the down state, and we put them into our Hilbert space like this. And that idea continued in our discussion of the quantum mechanics of what was going on, in that when we were thinking about the spin magnetic moment of an electron being at some angle, say, theta to the z-axis in real space, we had to work with theta over 2 as the angle between the up and down states in Hilbert space. This, you may recall, gave us things like cos squared theta over 2 and the like in some formulae as we took components in Hilbert space. For example, if we had an electron spin magnetic moment at an angle of 45 degrees to the z-axis in real space, we found that the state vector for that electron had to have a little bit of up and a little bit of down, and the formula involved the cosine and sine of 22 and a half degrees. That all came from the taking of components in Hilbert space. We had the state with spin of 45 degrees to the z-axis equal to cos 22.5 of our up basis state plus sine 22.5 times our down basis state. And this gave 0.924 times the up state plus 0.383 times the down state. And if you remember, because the square of these are the probabilities of measuring the component of spin to be up or down in the z-direction, we obtained an 85% probability of measuring the component of this 45 degree spin as being up in the z-direction and a 15% probability of it being down. The 85-15 split kept cropping up for spin-a-half particles whenever 45 degrees was involved in real space and all because we had to halve the angle for combining things in Hilbert space. Now contrast that with what we have here in the case of photons and their polarization. Here is our new Hilbert space for photons, with the vertical and horizontal basis states drawn at 90 degrees to one another. But the directions of polarization of our two states in real space are also 90 degrees to one another. 
vertical and horizontal. This means that there will not be any need to halve angles as there was for electrons. For example, if we had a photon with a polarization at 45 degrees to the z-axis, I'll draw it as a double-headed arrow in the real space diagram, it will be a state in Hilbert space also at 45 degrees between the vertical and horizontal states V and H. This means that the state vector in Hilbert space for a photon with polarization at 45 degrees to the z-axis in real space can once again be found by taking components in Hilbert space, but there's no halving involved. The state for this 45 degree polarization would be given in terms of V and H as cos 45 of V plus sine 45 times H and this gives 0 0.707 times the V basis state plus 0 0.707 times the horizontal basis state where 1 over root 2 has been written as 0 0.707. Also from the quantum mechanics that we know about the squares of these are the probabilities of measuring the polarization to be vertical or horizontal. 0.707 squared is a half, which means that there is a 50% chance of the polarization being measured as vertical and a 50% chance of it being horizontal. That should make perfect sense from what we've just discussed about polarization and filters. Namely, if you had a photon with polarization of 45 degrees to the vertical and you passed it through a polarization filter set to the vertical so that it would only allow vertically polarized light through, then there would be a 50% chance of that photon passing through and a 50% chance of it being blocked. Similarly, if you had the filter set at the horizontal so that it would only allow horizontally polarized light through, then there would also be a 50% chance of a 45 degree photon getting through. So, having decided on our two orthogonal basis states, we could write them as column vectors if we wanted, such as 1, 0 and 0, 1, where obviously the top entry stands for vertical polarization and the bottom for horizontal. This one represents all vertical and no horizontal, and this represents no vertical and all horizontal. We could then invent operators to measure the polarization in certain directions. However, none of this should be necessary. With a little faith, we should be able to skip all that mathematics and use what we did for electrons as a model. Two states, one zero zero one, We've done all the mathematics for electrons, so we're going to map across the quantum mechanics of all that to photons, remembering that we don't need to halve the angles. OK, so we now have the basis states that we can use for a single photon, an unentangled photon. What we now need, of course, is a set of basis states for two photons at the same time, never mind whether they are entangled or not just yet. What we do is to follow the exact same procedure that we did for electrons in an earlier video, number 8. We will call the two photons photon A and photon B, and they will each have their own separate two-dimensional Hilbert space, where we, where we label the kets VA, HA, and VB, HB. We said in that earlier video that mathematically the way to bring these two spaces together is to find what is called the tensor product of them. And we used a simple picture to represent the multiplication of one two-dimensional space by another. There's photon A with its two states, vertical for A, horizontal for A. And there's photon B with its two states, vertical for B and horizontal for B. We suggested that there would need to be four permutations of these in a kind of cross-tabulation. And so we take these four permutations to represent the four basis vectors for our two photons considered together. Effectively, each of these is one of the four dimensions of the new Hilbert space for two photons. This label will denote the state of the two photons where A is vertical and B is vertical. This label will denote the state where A is vertical and B is horizontal. This one where A is horizontal and B is vertical. Of course, finally, where A is horizontal and B is horizontal.
So, similar to before, I will use this notation for the four basis states of the four-dimensional Hilbert space of two photons, A and B, where I've used the four new Ket brackets. Also, once again, even though the first entry in each Ket will always denote photon A and the second photon B, I shall from now on colour the state for photon A amber and that for photon B in blue. These, then, are the four basis states that make up the four-dimensional Hilbert space of two photons. And just as with electrons, we will assume two things about these states. Firstly, each one of the four states is normalized. In vector terms, that's like having a unit length. So the inner product of one with itself is unity. Secondly, we will assume these states are each orthogonal to one another, so that the inner product of one of the states with any other of the three must be zero. So we now have the four symbols or kets for our four basis states which represent the polarization states of two photons considered together. Just as with electrons, we could now consider some kind of general state of the two photons, not necessarily entangled, where one of the photons is polarized in some general direction and the other is polarized in some other direction. In this general state, A, B, C and D are possible complex numbers, different values of which will produce states representing two photons with polarizations in various directions in space. However, we don't really need any of this right now. I simply wanted to show it you for completeness. What we really need is the expression for the entangled state of two photons using this set of four basis states. And if you remember, in discussing electrons, the entangled state of two electrons in what we call the singlet state had the state vector written like this. It was a simple mixture of the up-down and down-up basis states, normalized by having a 1 over root 2 as a coefficient of each basis vector. It was also possible to show from the mathematics that this expression is identical to right left minus left right in the brackets or in out minus out in or indeed any pair of opposite direction spins because the spin of the electrons while entangled could not be said to have any specific direction in space just that the spins were opposite. The up down minus down up was as good a way as any to write it, especially as Z was our preferred direction. So that was the entangled state for the electron spins that were opposite the singlet state. You may also recall that a pair of electrons could be entangled with their spins in the same direction, and this was called the triplet state. The state vector for the zero component of the total spin in the triplet state was given by this. The only difference here is the presence of a positive rather than a negative sign in the bracket. We didn't spend much time on this or delve into the quantum mechanics of the triplet state, but rather we concentrated on the singlet state where the spins of the entangled electrons were opposite. Now that was just a reminder of the electron situation because here's where I want to make a leap or a kind of mapping to what we did with electrons to what we will use for photons. I want to suggest, without launching into another load of mathematics, that the state vectors in our new four-dimensional Hilbert space for two photons that are entangled can be written in the following ways. Now, I've only written two here, but there are, in fact, four such states which are known as Bell states. The other two simply have a negative sign instead of a positive sign inside the bracket. The second one of these two here will be the important one for us, as we are mostly going to be considering entangled photons with polarizations in the same direction. The first expression written here and its negative counterpart, neither of which we're going to use in the future, applies to two photons that are tangled in such a way that their directions of polarization are at 90 degrees to each other. You can see that from the two parts of the state vector. Suppose the polarization of A is measured and found to be vertical, then the state, this state, would collapse to simply the first part of the expression, vertical for A, horizontal for B.
Similarly, if A is measured and found to be horizontal, then, the, then that state collapses to the second part of the expression. You may ask what happens if the polarization is measured to be other than vertical or horizontal. And if you don't realize that already from our work on electrons, we'll get to that idea in a minute. The second of these expressions and its negative counterpart applies to two entangled photons where their directions of polarization are in the same direction. And this is going to be the type of entangled photons that we will be dealing with in our Bell test discussion later. The same kind of argument applies, however, that if A is measured vertical, collapse takes place, and B must also be vertical, and so on. I could also have written the states with more visual labels in the kets. For example, the positive sign perpendicular entangled state could have been written with vertical arrows for V and horizontal arrows for H. Remember, what goes inside the ket is only a kind of label. Similarly, the positive sign parallel entangled state, where both photons must have the same polarization, could have been written like this. However, Adding arrows like this, and even using V and H, can be deceptive if you're not careful. You must keep aware of the fact that none of this implies that the photons represented by this state are necessarily vertically or horizontally polarized. And this gets to the question I posed a moment ago. Let me focus on the entangled state that we are going to be interested in, the one we will use in our Bell test experiment later. This is the one where the polarizations of the two entangled photons must be in the same direction. Remember that this entangled state can be written in any number of ways as long as the polarizations of A and B are in the same direction. For example, these three representations and a myriad of others could all be shown mathematically to be identical to one another. The first way of writing the parallel state means that we can say, suppose the polarization of A is measured and found to be vertical, then this part of the state is the relevant bit, and the state collapses to simply this one part of the expression, and the polarization of B must be vertical also. On the other hand, if the polarization direction of A is measured and found to be horizontal, then this part of the state is the relevant bit, and the state collapses to this part of the expression, and the polarization of photon B must also be horizontal. But this vertical and horizontal pairing within the state isn't really a fixed part of the state. The second expression is mathematically exactly the same as the first one. This represents the same state. This means that if a filter is used on photon A and the filter is in this direction and if the photon gets through then the polarization of A is in this direction. The state collapses to this and photon B also has polarization in this direction. On the other hand, if photon A does not get through the first measurement it means that its polarization must be perpendicular to the filter and it must be this. The state collapses to this and photon B must also have its polarization in this direction. I'm sure you realize that there are an infinite number of ways of writing this same state, and literally you can play around with the mathematics, substituting one thing into another, and move from one way of writing the state to another. This means that however you position the filter for the measurement of photon A, the state will collapse after measurement so that photon B has exactly the same direction of polarization as A. There is no definite direction of the polarization of the photons when they're in an entangled state. All we can say is that in this state the two photon polarizations are parallel to one another in terms of their polarization. There's obviously no best way to write the state, so we pick one and use the vertical horizontal system with V and H in the kets. The presence of the V's and H's in our entangled state is a bit like having up and down in the states for entangled electrons, when the measured spin of the electrons might be anything but up or down. Anyway, armed with all this background knowledge about the entanglement of photons, we are now in a position to discuss and hopefully make sense of the kind of Bell test that can be done in practice using entangled photons.